I'm going to take the approach to Aristotle that I use in Christianity and the Hellenistic world, and I'm going to use that as the basis for the other remarks that I'm going to make about Aristotle. Now, one thing, as you can tell, that I've been trying to do throughout the course so far is to take these philosophical ideas and plug them into important theological important theological issues. Uh, depending upon the time, there is at least one theological issue that I want us to get out of this, and that is the relevance of Aristotle's view of God to perhaps the most crucial challenge to Christian theology today, the challenge that comes from process theology. And one of the things I hope to show you is how uh, process theologians uh, try to build a case against Christian thought by trying to make all of us guilty of confusing the God of the Bible with Aristotle's God. Now, that confusion does exist in Christian thought. It may occur in Thomas Aquinas' medieval philosophy and theology. There may well be a lot of Christians out there who think about God in categories that owe more to Aristotle's philosophy than they do to the Bible, and whenever that's the case, these, keep, these people are going to be fair game for the evangelistic or the proselytizing efforts of process theologians. Now, if you don't know what process theology is, let me, uh, let me describe it in... Um, in, in, in unbiased, objective terms. It is probably the most serious heresy <laughs> presently existing within Christendom, okay? That's about as objective and unbiased a description I can give. The most serious heresy presently existing. Where have all the liberals gone? Well, <laughs> most of them who have gone towards process theology. Now, uh, when we were talking about Plato last week, I summarized Plato's philosophy in terms of three kinds of dualism. We called them metaphysical dualism, epistemological dual. This is Plato. Metaphysical dualism, epistemological dualism, and anthropological dualism. The easiest way to understand Aristotle and to explain Aristotle is to present him as a critic of all three kinds of dualism that were so crucial to Plato's thought. Did Plato divide reality into two different worlds? He sure did. Plato or Aristotle rejects that dualism. For Aristotle, there is only one world and it is this world in which we exist. I'll come back very quickly and pursue that in more detail. Did Plato divide knowledge into two states, two faculties? Yes, he did. Reason and experience, knowledge versus opinion. Why did Plato do that? Answer, because human beings live in two different worlds, and we, we operate through two different... Um, through two different faculties, reason and experience. So Plato make you know, if it, once you buy Plato's beginning premises, everything else seems to fall into place. And then finally, did Plato divide a human being into two different substances? Yes, he did. Body and soul. Body having its home, its natural home in this world, and the soul having its natural home in the world of the forms. Let's talk, first of all, about Aristotle's repudiation, his rejection of metaf Plato's metaphysical dualism. Now, follow me here, because this, this is going to be a long story. There are going to be a number of bases that I touch along the way. Uh, so on your notes, you might just just give this the general heading, Aristotle's rejection of Plato's metaphysical dualism, 
and then watch the bases that we touch uh, in our uh, unpacking of this. Plato, as you now know, believed that forms, universals, eternal, unchanging essences must exist. Let me say to you that that is a position with which I believe every thinking Christian must agree. There are people, there are philosophers who reject the existence of universals or forms. We will meet them, we will meet these people during the Middle Ages if we have time. We sometimes call them nominalists. Don't worry about that for now. But please realize that it is one thing to believe in the existence of universals, essences. It is something else entirely to insist that these universals must exist in a separate kind of reality, in a separate kind of world. Aristotle never doubted the existence of form. In fact, Aristotle insisted that form must exist. But Aristotle didn't go along with Plato's suggestion that the forms exist in a separate or higher world. And therefore, as professors of philosophy are sometimes prone to say, what Aristotle did was bring Plato's forms or universals down to earth. Aristotle brought Plato's separate world of the forms down to earth. And so, Aristotle said, there are essences. These essences are very like what Plato said they were, that is, eternal, unchanging things, but they exist down here in this world. Question. In what way do Aristotle's forms exist down here in this world? Well, the answer to that question lies in an analysis of what Aristotle called substance. I just gave you a very important transition sentence. I'm going to repeat it. So, uh, sometimes the most important sentences of a lecture are those sentences, transition sentences, where we go from one idea to another. I'll repeat the transition. The answer to the question of how Aristotle brought Plato's forms down to earth lies in Aristotle's, in an, ana in an analysis of Aristotle's notion of substance. We encountered this word last week. It was one of the questions on today's quiz. As Aristotle analyzed all of the kinds of predicates, categories that we can use when we think about things, the most important of all predicates is the one that identifies the substance of something. Now, what does he mean by the substance of something? Well, he means the... the um, the peculiar existence and beingness of that thing. That's too abstract. Let me, let me give you a definition of the word substance for Aristotle. For Aristotle, a substance is simply any concrete thing that exists. A substance is anything that has being, that exists. Well, there are lots of substances in this room. This piano is a substance. This piece of chalk is a substance. This particular hair on my head is a substance. There are lots of them up there, but I hope you can see the one that I'm pointing at. This pen is a substance. There's nothing mysterious about the notion of substance for Aristotle. If something exists, then it's a substance. Well, with a little qualification. The color yellow, which is the color of my shirt, the color yellow exists, but it doesn't exist in as fundamental a way as my shirt does. Remember last week I talked to you briefly about the difference between essence 
and essential property and non-essential properties. I was going to write the word accident, which is often used as a synonym for a non-essential property. Color is a property of something. Properties exist, but, in, but, but properties, in order, to, in order for a property to exist, there must be some substance for it to be a part of. We never encounter yellow just floating around in space somewhere. Yellow, to exist, must always be a defining or distinguishing characteristic of some substance. In this case, my shirt or that shirt over there. So even though we've said that a substance is anything that has being, what we want to do is also rush to make clear that we're talking about essential being here. We're not talking about the properties of something. Okay. Now, once we recognize that a particular chair is a substance, a particular human body is a substance, a particular shirt is a substance, then, er then we go on to note that for Aristotle, every substance is composed of two things. We're on our way to an answer here. Every substance is composed of two things. It is composed of some matter plus some form. Matter plus form. I'm going to put the word form above the word matter. Let's take my shirt. No, don't take it really but uh, let's consider my shirt I suppose this is probably probably made in Taiwan It's probably some cheap synthetic fabric it certainly isn't co uh, cotton well whatever this shirt is made of is its matter let's say it's polyester or something like that well uh, that fabric that matter can be turned into lots of things it can be made into all kinds of articles of clothing. It can be made into, uh, uh, I suppose, some things that, that, that can't be used as clothing. What makes this particular instance of polyester a shirt instead of a sheet, let us say, or something else, is the, is the peculiar form that it has been given. Now, what is the form? And the answer is, the form of anything is the essential property or the set of essential properties that, that place it within a particular class of things. So if this particular piece of fabric has been given a form that makes it a member of the class shirt or article of clothing or something like that, that for Aristotle is the essence. Well, let's take a little better example. In this room, there are probably 70 chairs exactly like the one you're sitting on, exactly like the one I'm pointing to, 60 or 70 of them. They're back there, you're sitting on one. Each of these particular chairs is a substance. Each of these particular chairs, each of these particular, each particular chair is composed of similar matter, some kind of metal or plastic and some kind of cloth, obviously a very expensive piece of furniture. Now notice that even though we have all of these particular chairs in here, they are all members of the same class or set or group. Remember, when we were talking about Plato, we distinguished between a set of things with some kind of defining property or characteristic and the many members of the set. All right, well here, what I'm doing on the board is I've drawn a circle, the circle standing for the set of chairs, and then each of the particular chairs in this room is a member of that set. Now, when Aristotle talks about form, he's referring to exactly what Plato meant by form. That is, the essence of the thing, the, de the defining characteristic or characteristics that makes it a member of one set rather than another. Why is this particular collection of metal and cloth a chair and not some other kind of furniture or some other kind of thing entirely? And the answer is because of its form, because of its essence. Well, 
What Aristotle is getting at is simply this. There is such a thing as form, but it doesn't exist in another world. It only exists in this world as a part of each particular thing. So is there such a thing as dogginess, the essence of dog? Yes. Where does dogginess exist? Answer, it is an essential part of every member of the, of the class of dogs. Is there such a thing as chairness? Yes. Where does it exist? In this world as an essential part of, every, of everything that is a member of the class of chairs. Is there such a thing as circularity? Remember the perfect circle? Aristotle would say yes. But that form is a part of every circle that we, or circle-like object that we encounter in this world. Now notice one important consequence of Aristotle's position. Because the true objects of human knowledge and human concern exist in another world for Plato, Plato didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to this world. He really didn't. The closest he came, I suppose, to talking about science is in his Timaeus, where he began to play around with a possible theory about the creation of the world. But notice for Aristotle, this world is preeminently important. Aristotle doesn't care about the other world because the other world doesn't exist. That's why Aristotle was so interested in the natural sciences. In a sense, in a very important sense, Aristotle is not only a great philosopher, he is the first really great scientist in the history of the human race. This is a man who wrote about astronomy. This is a man who wrote about physics. This is a man who, who actually performed vivisection. He, he experimented on living animals. He was, in, he was greatly, he was, he was very curious about what makes this world tick. As I said, he wrote one of his larger books is called On the History of Elephants, uh, which again is a token of how interested he is in the things in this world. Well, for Aristotle then, there is only one world, it is this world, and what Plato called form exists as a part of every particular thing that exists in this world. That's all the time we can give that notion. Maybe I'll take a question or two. But, um, you know, maybe you can also spend some time pursuing this in some of the books that are in the library, if you wish. But any questions? Yes? Doesn't Aristotle do to make it easier to accept the idea that we can tell what circularity is, not from having an idea already in our mind of circularity, but from seeing all the various circles, and then out of those, getting the notion of what circularity is? Doesn't Aristotle's theory make it easier for us to explain or understand where we get our idea? All right. I will grant that if you, if you start following Aristotle down his street, and it is a street that I think most people find easier to walk down than they do Plato's street. If you start walking down Aristotle's street, it is going to be easier for you to think that an empiricistic answer to questions of human knowledge will be possible. I can only here refer you back to an argument that appears right in the middle of the Phaedo. I drew your attention to it very quickly. I don't think Aristotle's, Aristotle's theory of knowledge works. I think it ultimately stumbles over the fact uh, that we must have an innate or, or an, an earlier idea of these universals before we can recognize them in the particular things that we encounter. This suggestion of Aristotle that we see instance after instance of this particular universal and then finally we come to recognize what is common to all of them by abstracting something from our experience just doesn't work. I think Aris, as difficult as, as it is to make our way through this um, uh, through this patch of uh, 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 patch of problems, I think er Plato has the advantage in at least recognizing that our understanding of the form comes prior to our sense experience. But that's what makes some of us empiricists and some of us rationalists. 
we've yet to talk about Aristotle's theory of knowledge, which is the next point that we're going to get on. Yeah. Uh, as I understand, uh, Aristotle, everything is in the empirical realm. The forms are brought to the empirical realm. Therefore, they are not eternal, unchanging absolutes. No, the forms for Aristotle are still unchanging. Let me, I'm glad you asked that question. Circularity can never change. If it did change, what would it be? It would be not the non-circle. Equality can't change. What would it be? It would be the non-equal. Aristotle explains change. I guess we might as well say this. I was going to skip it. <laughs> Aristotle explains change in a very kind of artificial way. Let's say we, we're dealing with a chair, which is matter plus form. The matter being the metal and the fabric that make up the chair. The form being the essence of chairness. Now, chairness, the essence, the form, can never change. If it did change, it would no longer be chairness. It would be something else. But Aristotle says, what happens when we change the chair into something else? Let's say we, we put this particular chair in a furnace and we melt down the metal or we rearrange the components in some way and we make a table. Aristotle would say that this matter loses the form of chairness. Who am I talking to? You. It loses the form of chairness and it acquires the new form of tableness. Notice that the matter remains the same. It is the same matter, that is the metal and everything else, but the form is now different. Now the world has a lot of Aristotelians in it, and they, uh, they wouldn't be Aristotelians unless they thought there was something to this. But notice one rather embarrassing question. When any substance loses its form, where does that form go? <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I readily admit there are all kinds of problems with Platonism, but at least Plato never had any doubts about where the forms were, all right? What is this business about some substance gaining a form? Where does the new form come from and losing a form? Now, I suppose if I were more of an Aristotelian, I'd, I'd be less skeptical at this point. But let's take still another example. Let's leave this, let's leave this table here which is matter plus form, and let us recognize that insofar as we're concentrating just upon the table, we are dealing with its essence. But every, every substance that exists also has non-essential properties. And so take the table that you're sitting at and let that, let that table be symbolized by this little uh, drawing on the blackboard in addition to the matter and the form that make the table what it is, every one of every table also has certain non-essential properties. It has certain non-essential properties. Its color is a non-essential property. Its size is a non-essential property. So suppose you're sitting at a brown table. What we have is matter plus form metal given an essence that also has the non-essential property of brownness. Now what we're going to do is paint your table red. Now how does Aristotle explain that? Answer, by saying the table loses the property of brownness and it acquires the property of redness. Well, <coughs> If you ever decide you want to become an Aristotelian, you're going to have to think that way. You're going to have to talk that way. If, if these universals only exist as parts of concrete, specific things, pray tell me, where does that universal go when, it, when that substance loses it and gains a new property? That's probably a trivial question, but right now I don't know that how I could answer it, and I really, don't, <laughs> I really don't care how it is answered. Well, let's move on. We don't want to lose the whole day on Aristotle. There are more interesting things ahead of us. Yes. 
definition of a column again? I missed the word. The form of something is simply, well, I defined it in several ways. The form of anything is its essence. It is also the defining or distinguishing property that places a thing within a certain class, okay? Um, okay. Yeah. Sure. This has a change in generation being one of those. Yeah. With that, the form and the matter. Okay, good question. Last week, we gave names to four kinds of change. All of those four kinds of change relating to the first four kinds of categories that Aristotle talked about. What I've just given you, that is changing a table into a desk, is an example of generation and corruption. When we destroy the table, that is when the table ceases to be a table, that's corruption. A former substance has ceased to exist. When we turn the table into something, when we turn the chair rather into something different, like a table, we've we've instituted the change called generation. Now, when we paint the table a different color, that's the kind of change that Aristotle calls alteration. We have changed some quality of the thing. Let's move on. Epistemological dualism. Plato, again, believed that there were two kinds, two two sorts of knowledge or two sorts of epistemological states because we were dealing with two different worlds. Since there's only one world for Aristotle, you don't need that separation of, you don't need that kind of epistemological dualism that Plato talked about. So I'm now going to give you an explanation of how Aristotle accounted for human sense knowledge. I'm drawing on the board the face of, oh, let's say, a Western Kentucky University freshman. He's smiling because he's too dumb to know better. Uh, he's too dumb to know what's ahead of him, all right, or something. Here he is, our little, our little freshman. And our little freshman perceives, has sense awareness of some particular thing. What could it be? Let us say that he perceives a chair again. That seems to be a pretty easy thing. So here's a chair in the world outside of his mind, and our little freshman, he has sense perception of the chair, and consequently, he forms in his mind a mental image of the chair. All right? Now, it's at this point we want to get inside this kid's mind. <laughs> inside of, you laugh, but this is a picture of your mind too, all right? Inside every person's mind or noose are two intellects. Aristotle calls them the passive intellect. and the active intellect. Now you may be saying, do I really need to know this? Well, in case any of you are thinking of becoming a Thomas, the follower of Thomas Aquinas, you might as well know about this, because this is one of the things you have to believe if you're going to become a Thomist. Most of the key features of Aquinas's philosophy are simply borrowed from Aristotle. The passive intellect is simply the part of our mind that receives information through our senses. Get the connection between receiving and being passive. Now, look around the room, and as you perceive different things in this room, images of those things are recorded in your consciousness. You see images of particular things. You see an image of me and of my shirt and of the eraser I'm holding and of the chalk that I'm holding. So let's draw a little chair inside of our freshman's mind. That's going to be a, a mental image of some particular chair that he perceives through his senses. 
Let's also give a technical name to this. We might as well go all the way here. Aristotle calls this mental image of the chair a phantasm. I'm sorry about that, but you might as well know the vocabulary. The phantasm is simply the, the, the mental image of the particular, the particular mental image of the particular chair that has been received and is there in this person's passive intellect. Aristotle says at this point in the process, our person does not yet have knowledge. Knowledge can never have as its object some particular thing. In order to have true knowledge, you must have achieved an awareness of the essence of something, of the form of something. So all that we have up to this point is potential knowledge. It's potential because it provides a building block that can be turned into knowledge if something else happens. But it is not yet knowledge because it is too limited, it is confined solely to some particular thing. Now, the active intellect takes over. Something that's passive doesn't do anything, it just sits there and receives. Something that's active is an agent. It's doing something. So Aristotle says this active intellect takes the phantasm, takes the particular sense image of this particular chair, and what it does is abstract from that particular thing the form or the essence of chairness. Strictly speaking, Aristotle would say, you, and he's, he, he and Plato are on the same wavelength here, Strictly speaking, you don't have knowledge of particular things. You have knowledge only when you move beyond the particular thing to understand what it has in common with other members of its class or its set. So the active intellect abstracts the formal element, the essence, the form from the particular thing and gives you actual knowledge. Now, in one sense, we wouldn't have to pay much attention at all to Aristotle's active intellect, except for one little curious thing. In his work on psychology, Aristotle uses the word immortal only in connection with the active intellect. I will tell you in a moment when we talk about Aristotle's view of a human being that he does not use the word soul in a way that gives us any hope that there is, there is conscious life after death so far as the human soul is concerned. But there is this passage, and I give you the location of it in the, in the purple book, there's this passage in Aristotle's work on psychology where he says some strange things about the active intellect. He says it is separable and immortal. Ooh, separable and immortal. Now remember, this is a guy whose view of the soul would lead you to believe that there can be no life, there can be no consciousness after death, something we'll talk about in just a moment. But here is the same fellow telling us that the active intellect is separable and immortal. Separable from what? Immortal in what sense? I, re I explain in the Purple Book that this mysterious passage generated three totally different interpretations for the next thousand years. In fact, these three basically different ways of interpreting Aristotle's active intellect are the key to understanding the history of philosophy for the next 1,000 years. It's, it's, it's incredible that this one sentence this one paragraph could generate three such different outlooks which t tend to, to become uh, 
transformed into the three basic kinds of philosophy that you'll find between, well, what's, what's in here will be Augustine and Plotinus and Aquinas. Now, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here. I really must move along. But let me just quickly zero in on a couple of points here. One interpretation of Aristotle is that the active intellect he's talking about is, in fact, a separate part of each individual human being that really will survive the death of the human body. That's Aquinas' interpretation. When we get to Aquinas, sometime in 1992, probably, <laughs> I'll explain to you that Aquinas had a public relations problem at his point in the history of philosophy. He had to make Aristotle palatable to Christians who associated Aristotle with heresy and unbelief. And one of the reasons why many Catholic Christians in, in Aquinas' day rejected Aristotle is because they thought that an Aristotelian view of, hum of a human being led to a denial of life after death. So Aquinas jumped on this passage and said, there! Aristotle really did believe in life after death. He really did believe there's an immortal part of a human being, only instead of his calling that the soul, he called it the active intellect. Nah, that, that's a bad interpretation of Aristotle. It's good public relations, but it's bad philosophy. And someday, maybe down the road, I can explain why. Augustine came along and he said, I think the active intellect that, Aquinas, that Aristotle was talking about is God. This light present in the human mind that turns potential knowledge into actual knowledge must be the light of God. That's Augustine, his theory of divine illumination. So the active intellect for Augustine and people like that becomes not a separate part of, human, of a human being, but a presence an illuminating activity and presence of God in the human mind, which would make us, it would be this thing that would make us different from the animals, you see. God, God has created us in His image. He's constantly present and operating in this brain tissue of ours, and it is His activity, His illuminating activity, which makes knowledge possible. Well, the third interpretation is the interpretation of Plotinus, a man that we'll get to in a couple of weeks, and it was this interpretation that went that that was dominant during the Middle Ages and that influenced Arabic and Muslim philosophers. Plotinus interpreted the active intellect as a kind of cosmic intelligence, a kind of impersonal, superhuman mind, not God, but a kind of cosmic mind, a part of which or a, or the activity of which is present in every human mind. Well, Read that section of the uh, purple book and get what you can from it, and there's a question. Yes? Um, is, is the act of intellect the place where we put abstract principles like equality and justice? Yes. Well, um, what images do we passively receive to get uh, at a principle like justice? Oh, there's a good question. Uh, it's, it's easy to see how we have sensible images of chairs and desks and thus can abstract the form of the universal that is common to them, but you're saying, what specific images do we get that, um, that, that lead to the general concept of justice and goodness? Yeah, I agree. That's a tough problem. What Aristotle would say is that we perceive specific instances of just actions, okay, or good actions. So uh, we see them, and from them we abstract the idea. That is really very weak. Uh, I couldn't entertain that move for more than two seconds. And at that the two seconds are up. That really won't work. Okay, anthropological dualism. Very quickly, Plato believed a human being is a body and a soul. Two substances, one of which will die, the other one of which is immortal, inherently immortal. I've already criticized Plato's view of a human being because I think it's clearly inconsistent with what we find in Scripture. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me when I say this, but I think Aristotle's view of a human being is closer to what we find in the New Testament than Plato. 
I guess I have to tell you what Aristotle's view is first, and then you can see how it's closer if you wish. Plato, Aristotle's view of a, of a human being is more holistic. You can spell that. Well, the best way to spell it is H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, holistic. This is not a Kentucky way of spelling holistic. This is just the way we do it. In other words, Aristotle sees a human being as a person, as a being in whom body and soul are, are far more closely related than you can find in, Ari in Plato's theory. And I think, I th even though Aristotle had no influence on Scripture at all, no influence at all, if we're looking for paradigms, if we're looking for models, I think we're closer to the New Testament here than we are in Plato for this reason. Scripture does not teach that the human body is evil, is an inferior part of us, which we look forward to getting rid of. Read 1 Corinthians 15. Death is the final enemy. There's something unnatural about death because it does introduce this separation between uh, core elements of us. Um, if, if the body were not an integral part of a human being, Scripture wouldn't place as much emphasis upon the resurrection of the body as it obviously does. So in trying to understand the mystery that is a human being, uh, Aristotle might, in this case, turn out to be a better guide than Plato by stressing the closer relationship between body and soul. Still leaving open, of course, all of the tough questions about the intermediate state and, uh, you know, all of those tough issues that we've already uh, skirted to, to some extent. Well, I could go into some d more detail about Aristotle's view of soul, but we must move along. So let me quickly turn to Aristotle's view of God. We, earlier I told you that for Aristotle every particular substance is a combination of matter plus form. I must now take that back. There are some substances which for Aristotle possess no matter whatsoever. There are some substances that are pure form. Now, there's a reason why Aristotle does this. Let's put the words matter and form on the board. And let me also add here an element of uh, um, encouragement. I'm aware of how difficult Aristotle can be, and I'm... I, I, I'm I promise you I'm going to demonstrate tremendous compassion next week. I'm not going to expect you to know the ins and outs of Aristotle's metaphysics. Just the outs. No. What I've written on the board are the words matter and form. Let's now introduce two final concepts in Aristotle's philosophy. Pay attention to this. Some other stuff I've talked about, you might, you might be safe in forgetting. But if you're the least bit drowsy right now, slap your face or pinch your nose or something. Pay attention, because you may see this again. I'm going to write on the blackboard, next to the words matter and form, the words potentiality and actuality. This is an important key to understanding Aristotle's answer to the question, what is change? Aristotle says, with respect to anything that exists, I'm putting my little stool on the table here, with respect to anything that exists, everything that exists has both potentiality and actuality. Now, any given thing can only have one actuality at a time. This collection of wood and cloth that we call a stool is in actuality one thing, a stool. It is in potentiality many other things. 
we could take the wood, the matter, that makes up this chair, and we could turn them, we could turn that matter into a variety of other things. We could turn them into toothpicks, all right? Might be big toothpicks, but we could make toothpicks out of them. And let your imagination run wild about all the other things we could make out of this matter, this wood. Every time a new substance comes into existence, the old actuality ceases to exist and one of the potentialities of that stuff's matter is actualized in a new kind of substance. Now, we, we introduce this because we want to get to the question of God. Aristotle's God. He was not a religious man. God, in Aristotle's thought, satisfied no religious impulse or need at all. Aristotle talked about God simply because there were certain problems in his philosophy that he couldn't solve in any other way. Aristotle's God was, in fact, a kind of deus ex machina. He just he just came to the end of his rope and he said, unless there is something else in reality, I can't explain such and such. And so came about his view of God. This being, who alone could function in Aristotle's philosophy as God, had to be an unmoved mover. or an unchanging changer. An unchanging changer. Let me explain why Aristotle's God had to be an unmoved mover, and then you will then I hope you'll be able to see why Aristotle's God had to be pure form. In his physics, boy this gets, I, 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 this gets complicated. In his physics, Aristotle understood reality in terms of a set of spheres. Spheres that explained the motion, of, let's put this the earth, that would be one sphere, and then you have corresponding other spheres for the moon and the sun and the stars and the planets. All in all, Aristotle said, there are 55 such spheres which really account for the major dimensions of the universe. The earth, the sphere for the sun, the sphere for the moon, there was a sphere for ether, and it, it gets kind of complicated. Now, Aristotle said, all of these spheres are moving. In fact, they've been moving from eternity. The world is eternal. Motion is eternal. It's always been going on, precisely as it's going on now. But when Aristotle got to the last sphere, he faced this question. What makes the last sphere move? The other spheres move because of the motion of the spheres beyond them, beyond it. But once you get to the last, ultimate, 55th sphere of reality, what causes it to move? Remember the business about efficient cause. The efficient cause or the, the cause for the motion of these other spheres are, these other, are the spheres beyond it. Aristotle said there must be a being, a mover, beyond the last sphere that is the cause for its motion. But suppose this mover beyond the last sphere himself moved. Then what would we be stuck with? The question, what makes him move? Or her move? Or if there are any feminists here, he, she, it move, all right? What makes the mover move. In other words, 
if there's motion or change in this mover, then you can ask what causes that motion, and thus you're stuck in kind of an infinite regress. So Aristotle said, sooner or later, in order to understand all of the other change and motion in the world, you've got to come up to a being who, co who, who is the cause of all of this other motion, but who himself is unmoved, does not change. And that is Aristotle's God. Now, why? once again, why must this mover be, un be himself unmoving? Because if he changes, then we've got to seek an explanation for that change in a more ultimate being, and sooner or later, you either get to an unmoved mover or you end up admitting there is no explanation for change at all. All right, now, get back to form and matter. Aristotle believed that God could not possess any matter whatsoever. Why? Because matter is the basis of potentiality. And potentiality necessarily involves you in change, you see? So if God's going to be the unmoved mover of the universe, God cannot have any potentiality whatsoever. He must be pure actuality. He must be pure form. Now what that means is, he must be so perfect that he is incapable of any change whatsoever. Well, as Aristotle continued to pursue this line of thought, he was led to this question. What does this God do if he is pure actuality, if he, is in, if he has no body, if he has no matter? What does he do? And Aristotle's answer is, the only thing he can do is think. Not stink, but think. That was the word. All this God of Aristotle's can do is think. All right, next question. What does he think about? Now watch this, because here's where we get to the, here's where we start down the path towards the punchline. A God who is as perfect as Aristotle's God can't think about people like you and me. Why? Because we're constantly changing. We're imperfect. Everything in the world is imperfect, is constantly undergoing change. Now Aristotle thought that if his God thought about anything that was changing or imperfect, that would introduce change and imperfection into his God, you see? So Aristotle's God cannot think about human beings. He can't think about anything in this world of particular things because that would corrupt his perfection. That would introduce change and imperfection into his being. So what is the only thing that Aristotle's God can do? Answer, all he can do is think about himself. That's it. Aristotle's God can only think about perfect, unchanging being, and that's himself. Now what's important here is this. A lot of Christian thinkers have gravitated to an idea of God that resembles to, to a great degree this unmoved mover of Aristotle. And without realizing it, what they do is they end up with a being who is so un incapable of change that he cannot love, that he cannot judge, that he cannot bring about things like the resurrection or the incarnation or uh, uh, the atonement. Now, process theologians have jumped all over this. Let me give you a picture of a classroom setting in a seminary where the professor is a process theologian. We could pick a seminary in my own denomination where this has gone on, the Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, for one thing. Um, what you have in that classroom are a group of pious, 
hopefully dedicated young men and women who somehow have picked up the idea that the Christian God is a great deal like Aristotle's God. But what that process theologian does very cleverly is this. He says to them, how can a God like that be the loving, caring God of the Bible? And that Southern Baptist kid says, ooh, I never thought of that. A God who is so perfect that he can't change in any way whatsoever can't possibly be a God who loves and cares for people. And before you know it, what the process theologian has done is trick that kid who came into class with an inadequate concept of God in the first place, trick that kid into thinking that that's what fundamentalists or evangelicals or conservatives believe, and then he gets the kid to believe that there, are, there is really only one option to that kind of heresy. And notice, a God, a, a Christian who believes in a God who can't care and love for people is immersed in heresy of some kind. He gets these kids to think that the only alternative to that heresy is the God of process theology. Now the duplicity of this is manifold because for one thing, process theologians don't give a tinker's nickel, which was the only expression that could come to my mind. They don't care what the Bible says. They don't get their theology from Scripture. Why anybody who doesn't believe in the authority of Scripture would appeal to Scripture in order to undermine this confused Aristotelian view of God in order to supplant it with an equally heretical view of God is one of the mysteries of our age. Process theologians don't care about the Bible. They get their view of God from certain philosophical ideas and presuppositions. Now what I try to do, and I do this in a, in, a, in a book I'm using in my apologetics class called The Concept of God, is I try to get Christians to realize that somebody has, has duped them. Somebody has set them up to accepting a false disjunction. Where over here we have Aristotle's God or Aquinas' God coming out of that stream of philosophy who is absolutely immovable and unchangeable. And over here we have the constantly changing and mutable and finite, fallible God of process theology, when the truth, in fact, is somewhere in the middle. Listen to me. When the Bible, and when, when Christian theologians tell you that God cannot change, what the, they are right, but what they are referring to is this is simply the fact that God cannot change with respect to his essential nature, with respect to his essential attributes, his properties. Immutability is what we call a second order property. Divine immutability means that God can never change with respect to his being loved. He always has been loved, he is loved, he will always be loved. He can never change with respect to that essential property. God can never change with respect to His holiness. He has always been holy. He will always be holy. He is unchangeable with respect to His justice, His goodness. God's immutability is our way of describing God's essential properties. He is unchanging in His nature. But we never, we never want to suggest that God cannot enter into changing relations with his creation. Because a God who cannot enter into changing relations with his creation is a God who could not be the God of the Exodus or the God of the Incarnation or the God of the Cross and the Resurrection. Okay, now, it must be time for a couple of questions. <laughs> Uh, you'd have to be asleep not to have some questions at this point. Yes. Okay. Uh, how does the unmoved mover move the last sphere without moving himself? And the answer is, he moves it by being the final cause of the universe. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But it, it, it's always, it always has a nice ring to it. What Aristotle means there is, 
The perfect God moves the world by being an object of the world's desire. This God is the object of the world's desire. That is, he doesn't change it himself. He changes it by being what the rest of the world wants to be. Perfect, pure actuality. Now, I'm going to give you an example. All right. How many of you have ever visited the Louvre Museum in Paris? All right. Now watch this. What was, where was the first room you headed for when you entered the Louvre? What was the first thing you were looking for? Mona Lisa. What? The Mona Lisa. How can an inert substance produce such activity on the part of millions of people. Everybody who enters the Louvre says, where is it? And they rush past the wing victory and they rush past all of the... They want to... And when we get there, when we enter the room and we see all of these people, we move right up to them. How can something cause motion like that? Answer, by being an object of desire. Maybe that's why the Mona Lisa is always smiling. Think about that. I don't... Well, in some mysterious way that's analogous to that, this perfect unmoved mover causes this change in the rest of the world. Doesn't make a bit of sense to me, but uh, it was the only answer Aristotle could possibly come up with. Yes? It sounded like the way you define the all right, your point is a good one. We've said that Aristotle rejects Plato's dualism, but isn't this a kind of, isn't he slipping in a kind of dualism through the back door? He's, he says he's denied Plato's world of perfect things, but he slips in this perfect being without which he thought his whole system would collapse. So, is there some inconsistency in, in Aristotle here? Well, I'll leave that for you to figure out. You have nothing else to worry about. One final question before we break, yes? Does the form, comparing Plato's forms to Aristotle, does, uh, remember before you were saying, when you, went, you don't know where the matter goes, where the forms go, and yeah. where is, uh, where is uh, Plato's Oh, the question is, where do Plato's forms go? And the, the answer is, they always are there. They don't go anywhere. But don't they need a particular to be a form? No, they don't need a... Plato's forms do not need a particular in order for them to exist. That, if you can call it a nice thing, is, is the nice thing about Plato's metaphysic. The form, the existence of the forms doesn't depend upon anything in this world. You just have these other problems in Plato's thought.